Welcome back to the Wise Build Bridges, a podcast brought to you by Viaduct Generation. Uh, on this episode, we're joined by the brilliant Luke Carthy, uh, who we've bumped into as a team a few times across some events. So it was only right that we got you onto the podcast. Thank you very much, Luke, for being here. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Uh, good to finally make this happen. I know we've been back and forth a few times. So <laughs> yeah, to, uh, yeah it, we yeah. got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so a little bit about Luke for those that don't know him. He is a well-seasoned e-commerce consultant, e-commerce store founder and international speaker, delivering double to triple digit growth for e-commerce brands. He parks himself right in the center of CRO, which I'm really looking forward to getting into, by the way, um, growth and SEO disciplines, having worked with brands spanning both D2C and B2B verticals, including Cat, Renault, and Mayflex. Luke knows a thing or two when it comes to getting C-suite buy-in and delivering smart, scalable e-commerce growth. Um, so that's a little little intro there, a little teaser to, to what to look forward to, what we might be digging into today. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the intro, appreciate it. Yeah, um, I mean, so yeah, I mean, I interrupted your intro with telling you how interested I was already to start talking about CRO, and it's definitely something that, as a head of marketing myself, is something that's super important. Um, and it really is understanding kind of like the value of CRO versus maybe SEO, um, in terms of kind of understanding i guess it's a better understanding of your audience and making that work for you i mean one of the things that you the first things that we see if you go into like your about you section on your website is that with one brand you manage to increase by 175 percent without even seeing the traffic change which i thought was really cool and interesting and it's definitely in a, a point maybe where we're at personally with vg where we feel like we've bought we've like grown quite a strong following and now it's about yeah. that conversion element which you know i think is there's back and forth in it what kind of for you was that point where you realized how important that component was yeah it's a really good question um so believe it or not it happened way before i jumped into my independent um consulting career really it was mm in a role where budgets were tight, ambition was high, this will be familiar for, for many people who work in house or with agencies, it's like, look, we want the world, but we don't want to pay for it. Um, yes. So it's kind of thinking outside the box and thinking creatively. So we knew SEO was a medium to long-term burn, as many people know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not an overnight fix. Um, mm. But while I was in a fortunate position where the developers in this particular role reported it to me directly so i had um their time and talents uh, at my disposal so i thought you know what if i can't swing um immediate roi from my role and my team and i was relatively new in the business let me start to think about things that i know i can move the needle on fairly quickly um and justify the return on right so we we looked into a, a number of issues one one uh, area i'm properly passionate about is in the world of e-commerce is, is site search um mm. and i'm never quiet about this one so anyone um who i talk to in this space site search is huge but it's just so untapped um because the people who search on your website are so much more likely to purchase than someone who is just browsing or, or coming through on you on you know other parts mm. of the site so you know ranking for a particular term takes x y and z components and there's no guarantees you've got to rank right you can do all the things right. you can do no guarantee with cro providing you have you know a decent amount of traffic a good audience by optimizing things on the site you can see um almost an immediate change and almost an immediate uplift or if it goes wrong uh, not so you know not, not such an uplift but in this situation i knew i needed to really kind of sell my position in the business what i'm capable of and develop a quick return so cro is the way of doing it um but what's really interesting here is when i was speaking to members of the board cro was never an independent channel um right. so you know when you think about your line manager or the board or wherever it is you report into seo gets a seat at the table paid search does um and you know there's kind of social and maybe other bits and pieces but cro 
is one of those channels that never, well, it's not really a channel, but one of those disciplines that never really gets a dedicated seat at the marketing. Mm. Um, but it actually worked in my favor because what it meant is I could put the wins into CRO. And at right. that point, because I've developed the wins, it's then a case of, ah, okay, this guy does what he's doing. Um, this channel technically, you know, makes us money, it's profitable. And then they release the purse strings to kind of go in and go in and, and get some more stuff. Um, but yeah, it's sometimes, uh, I think what's really important, this is probably a broader conversation about managing the board and expectations is nobody really cares in, as far as a board level in terms of um, the technicalities of what you did. They normally just care about the results and what difference Absolutely. you made. Right? So if you go to the board and say, hey, I did CRO, they're like, great, so what? But if you go to the board and say, hey, we increase revenue from digital by 175%, all of a sudden you've got their interest. And Absolutely. they really need more of that thing. Um, but yes, yeah, CRO is one of those things that I feel within reason, you can implement quicker, you're in more control of. And if you get all your data aligned first, can give you a much stronger return um, than SEO in, in the immediate. Mm, yeah, I think that, that, that's really interesting um, that you say that and that that's kind of how it all started in terms of this idea of maybe having a, a, a smaller budget or not as much investment being available and then saying okay well let me look at kind of a smaller niche or discipline kind of within this wider context um because I think it is also it is something I think I definitely know like our commercial team sometimes find it really difficult to sell on SEO because it is this really long-term strategy yeah. with you know that you've got to wait quite a while for those results whilst you're investing a significant amount of money into it so being able to kind of have I guess those quicker wins and those more tangible results that happen sooner rather than later that's definitely would you would you say it's almost like a stepping stone into kind of evolving that SEO budget or would you really still see them as these two separate kind of entities um I think it's whatever gets you to where you want to be right like um mm. So I wouldn't say, you know, to be frank, bullshit your way through it. But what I would say is if <laughs> your business is set up is in a situation where there isn't really an appetite for CRO, nobody gets it, there's no one in the business who needs to get it, yeah. but they understand digital marketing as a general thing, then just rope it under digital. Mm. If you have a director of SEO who's really interested in that, then, then you know, talk their language. Um, but for me, in my particular situation, it paid dividends to kind of wrap it all into the same channel. But you might be in a business right. where you're fortunate enough to have a dedicated CRO resource. But like, I think the way you kind of suss it out is you just listen, you ask the questions, you see what makes your, um, your line managers, your stakeholders tick, and you respond yeah. and communicate it with those particular points. So for example, if someone's really interested in conversion rate, cool, talk about that. If someone doesn't really care about traffic, there's probably no point roping it into SEO. If they only care about right. commercial e-commerce growth, then talk about e-commerce growth, right? But like tap into what their mm. pain is, what their objectives are, what their goals are, what their boss wants, right? And then kind of communicate from that way backwards. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's really interesting that, that, that you mentioned that because a lot of the time, and I think just in general, I think when it comes to marketing, sometimes like framing is the issue in terms of how you either kind of communicate deliverables but also like results and it is very much that case that when you're when you're in like in that boardroom or with much more senior executives or leadership and you're trying to kind of contextualize what you're doing then yeah maybe yeah. you don't necessarily need to go into every single approach or strategy that was given but it's more about we did this and it resulted in this in this exactly um but yeah, yeah i guess another point to just put on you mentioned a little while ago about um seo taking some time like if you mm. frame it in the right way seo can be immediate right it just depends on who you so like when we kind of right. got these initial quick win conversion optimization my um direct my md at the time like yeah seo did that and that then freed up more resource to go and do some of the more technical things right mm. so yes seo has this kind of stigma um and it's not a lie but stigma and kind of really slow churn you know it takes six to 12 months to see results and yes 
And the wider holistic way of looking at SEO, absolutely. But yeah. there's no reason why um, you can't be in a situation where you fix a handful of technical things, particularly in e-commerce, um, where mm. you fix it on a template and within maybe two to three weeks, you're seeing a win. Um, right. But to kind of wrap up the whole debacle of like SEO, return on investment and, and so on, what I'd say is really important is if I had to choose between doing CRO or SEO first, if that was a conscious choice I had to make, it would almost always be CRO first. Um, right. And the reason why, we'll very quickly touch on this, the reason why is if you bring all the traffic but your conversion is low, your return on investment for SEO is going to be quite low, right? If you spend five grand a month, whether mm. that's on hires or agency fees or whatever that is, and you've got lots of cool traffic mm. but your conversion is poor, your return on investment is going to be a heck of a lot lower than if you actually conversion is high, then you start yeah. to bring in the traffic after, and then you're doubling down on that, right? So I always say CRO before SEO, and if you're in a perfect situation, I mean, do both at the same time, right? But normally you've got to make a choice mm. somewhere. Right, that's really interesting, yeah. Because I would have said before kind of really looking into... I guess maybe it comes from kind of like my background and the way that maybe even like my previous company kind of saw it. It was kind of this idea. There was there was always a met a conversion metric when we were reporting back. Yeah. So there was we were definitely looking at things like traffic and things like that, but it was always contextualized under is it converting? And so then it was really, I guess, almost sometimes talking about the quality so maybe it wasn't a direct kind of CRO style strategy but it was under this idea of like what can we do with our with the traffic or how do we play around with the traffic that we've got to make sure that it's a high quality one coming in in the first place um yeah. but yeah without I guess separately saying here's our kind of almost like CRO strategy as well yeah 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 it's uh it's, uh, it's uh, the, the kind of analogy i love to use um for people who um aren't familiar with seo or just you know outside of context of digital marketing is i like to think of it like a market stall where mm. you can move the same market stall to somewhere with a lot more footfall and probably have right. you know five ten twenty percent more sales or worst case the same kind of level of sales as you've got so there's a lot more people coming but you're selling at the same percentage rate versus staying mm. where you are with the same level of footfall but having a much better stall whether that's like i don't know something that's more attractive or like you've got someone who's kind of going out and grabbing people or making a bit of noise or, or been in a different place where it's more visual yeah. like those sort of things are more likely to direct how much revenue you bring in versus how much footfall you have right so like a better stall Absolutely. is probably going to return better than more people um well, look, it, yeah. it's it swings and roundabouts. What works for e-commerce doesn't necessarily, you know, if it's something like a content site, then numbers is everything, right? The amount of visitors you get to a piece of content, Absolutely. if you're in a, um, you know, display networking and that sort of thing, then then great. Numbers are everything. But when it comes to e-com, mm. traffic is great, but like everyone's in the business in e-commerce to sell something, right? Whether it's immediately or generate leads or whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, in the world of ecom, I always believe that conversion is more profound as a quick win than than SEO for sure. For sure, nice. And actually, so talking about e-commerce, so from from my little deep dive on LinkedIn, you jumped into e-commerce pretty quickly. What like was it something that you found like really exciting? Was it something that was a bit more interesting for you? Like you managed to niche, yeah. kind of niche down pretty quickly. How, how did that kind of come about? Yeah, so I've always been in retail um, and I think retail and Nicolas are fairly closely aligned, but my first mm. ever job um, fresh out of college, God, this is going way back, was um, at Curry's. <laughs> let's uh, take it back. <laughs> I, well, let's take it back, right? So I was at Curry's at the time where the big kind of CRT TV, you know the big ones that used to have in the line, the big backs, mm, 32 inch, yes. whatever. <laughs> um, they were being phased out and uh, the new flat screens, the LCDs were being brought in. So um, a lot of the technology was changing. We we're going from the old bulky SCART leads, if you remember those things, through to now HDMI cables. And I thought mm. Curry's was selling these for an extortionate amount of money, like 60 quid for a meter's worth of cable. And I thought, 
it's just insane. So I, one weekend yeah. or something, uh, went on to, did some research, found some wholesale cables and thought, you know what, I'll take a point, I'll buy 20 of these and see if I can shift these. Um, so I set up an eBay business um, just to get make a few quid, sold those cables relatively quickly, and then kind of just got hooked in from that point, right? So I, I had a little miniature eBay store, which, you know, fast forward three, six months, um, I was buying a lot more products. My mum was was really annoyed because my whole bedroom was just full <laughs> to the brim with boxes. Um, she was like, what are you doing in it? Whatever it is, it better believe it. I'm like, it's fine. It's just boxes of cables. Um, and that was really where the e-commerce book started. And, and interestingly, where conversion uh, started for me as well, because it's right. the same thing on eBay. Um, optimizing your listings, refining your prices, you know, free delivery with a higher price mm. versus charge delivery with a lower price, free accessories, product images, product descriptions, like all of those things were things that I experimented around with. And I think it was then that first venture, if you like, that first entrepreneurial kind of decision that made me think e-commerce is what I love. Um, and it's just kind of gone on from there. So I've been in e-commerce as long yeah. as I've been in marketing. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do you know what? It's always really interesting when I do have these conversations. I feel like I've said interesting a lot. I need to find, I need to get a synonym for that one. But, you know, it's genuine. Um, but I think a lot of people that I speak to that are kind of within the SEO industry, it comes from experimenting and it comes from like their own kind of passion. It's either, yeah, I decided I'd build a website or I started looking into this or I learned about keyword research and I wanted to learn you know I found it interesting how it looks at the human mind into like to that yeah. respect and then kind of finding out afterwards that there's actually a job for that or there's there's work related to that to that interest were you kind of aware that this was something that you could then like create have as a career or did did that did it take a few attempts in like maybe different job like places and stuff like that yeah i'm not going to sit here and pretend it was like i know a lot of people will come onto podcasts and maybe this is a really important and maybe a transient episode where it's like you know what i'm not going to come here and sit and pretend that um i started an initial business and i've got to where i am today it wasn't all kind of like up and to the right um yeah like my first cables if i'm candid with you my first box of cables i bought way too bought way too many sorry not way too many but i bought way too expensive per unit um i was worried that right. they weren't going to come in like it took me a while and to spend some money and kind of you know the right images before they started to sell um i've mm. also had ventures in the past which have failed horrendously actually i don't think i've mentioned this on another podcast before but i was I was bankrupt at one point at the age of about 21 from just oh wow i thought that's yeah, scary i can be it's scary but i like had the comfort of my parents house so if you can go bankrupt at yeah. any point you might as well do wait and get it all out the do way it when you're young. System. <laughs> you know it's in a mortgage that's that's different right but like <laughs> so i made mistakes um i made some 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 you know genuine mistakes um buy the wrong product selling at the wrong time um one situation led to my paypal account being locked and i couldn't get the money out which was like there was a lot of things right but you, you yeah. kind of you, reach, you repeat you learn you adapt you kind of think god i'm not doing that again i'll try something else um yeah but i guess to, to really answer your question um did i know that e-commerce was where i was aiming for no because when i was uh, when mm. i was actually in education well, at the time i was selling on ebay i was at college thinking about going to university and I was actually studying um, plans to be an architect when I was at college. That was the dream. Oh, to actually okay. be a, interesting. An yeah, yeah right. I love engineering. Um, I love design, mm. and I thought well, those two things together was what I wanted to do. And then I studied it. I really kind of went into it and looked at it at college and thought, you know what, um, I like it, but the architecture mindset that i had or the, the dream of architecture was designing buildings like the boring and like you know these big right. multi-million yeah. and projects 99 percent of architects are building like properties and extensions and there's nothing wrong with that yeah but i had to like bring myself it's, it's a different back version back. of that <laughs> yeah so then i actually was then going to be an automotive designer because i love cars and thought again same thing full of regulations mm. you've got a great design built 
So I just kind of slept walk almost into marketing and thought, I like it. I'm good at it. Um, it seems like the right time. I love computers. I actually had another venture as well, which I need to quickly tell you about, which was buying used Mac computers and then upgrading right. the components in them and for a profit. Um, wow. So I did all sorts of tinkering, right? All sorts of messing about. Um, and I remember my first Mac that I did, I broke it. So I, I, I must have spent like almost all of my money on buying this <laughs> used Mac and all the parts. And I got it wrong. Like I put the screwdriver in the wrong place. I shorted a circuit and I just fried the whole thing. Well, like right. you learn from your mistakes. So I wasn't going to do that For again. Sure. So I, I then bought another Mac, bought more parts again, got it right this time, made about, I don't know, mm. 400 quid, which I paid about 20. was like life changing for me, right? Yeah. No bills. For sure. That's a home. couple of holidays. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the drinks in Ibiza, I saw it. Um, <laughs> and you know, that that's, that's kind of where I got to. So I've, yeah, rinse, repeat, learn, made mistakes. And even now, um, but no, I guess to, to, to quickly come around and answer your question, I didn't I didn't start selling on eBay and thought that that was where I was destined to end up, mm. if I'm honest, but I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool, though, that you seem to not have, like, a hugely kind of risk-averse mindset. Like, you're quite willing to try new things and to experiment where do you where do you think that comes from was that something you kind of were already always kind of encouraged to do or like yeah that's a really good question I've never really thought about it but um I mean that's probably why I'm an independent consultant now but I mm. became a consultant just before we knew anyone I mean COVID had just just come out right like it's a fresh new album but yeah. COVID was like on the news but we were, we were kind of naive <laughs> new flu like no one no one was locking down everyone was still going out doing that thing and i started a business then I, um but for me i guess me taking risks um is all about growth right like i always love to learn um and i think it's the reward on the opposite side and knowing that you've mm. made the, the right decision right like it's yeah i i just love a challenge i get bored quite yeah. easily um so i think sometimes it's great to take a risk as long as it's calculated. Um, but yeah, personally, I jumped into starting my first business as a consultant, should I say. So my full-time job independently, once I'd had two kids and a mortgage. Um, right. So it was a good time <laughs> to do it. Like, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just think it's yeah. a challenge. Um, and, and that's probably where it comes from nice amazing and actually so it's, it's quite funny that you did just mention about setting up your freelancers because that was actually one of the questions slash points that i wanted to bring up is that you did start it literally just before the pandemic hit and obviously it was a huge shift like everyone and everything moved online everything essentially kind of became an e-commerce store when it especially when it comes to retail how was that yeah. from your perspective what were you experiencing what were you seeing um i was i'll be honest i was petrified i was absolutely petrified because um although everything was going online and that kind of meant that e-commerce was becoming more accessible an easier conversation mm. people start throwing money at e-commerce as, as a general rule of thumb that yeah. was you can look at it in hindsight and know now that that was a great decision to make. But when you're in it at the time and the market's about to crash and no one's spending money and there's yeah. a massive lockdown and no one knows if they've got a job anymore, like my biggest fear was, oh my God, have I just made the biggest decision at the worst possible time? Um, but right. what actually happened, if I'm honest, is I caught a number of projects. Um, Sheely, just out of, I wouldn't say sheer look, like, you know, people work hard, you get your, your branding out and so on. But I picked up a couple of projects and then it just kind of turned into a domino effect. Um, mm. Plus, I do a lot of speaking at conferences. There's, you know, there's things that I do like you and I do with podcasts and I travel around Europe yeah. before lockdown to get, to talk about e-commerce. So there was things out in the universe that, that helped people to understand what I did and what I could offer. Um, and it just really took off from that point onwards. But it was, at one point, I thought I've made a terrible mistake, like one of those things. But actually, in hindsight, mm. 
And I'll tell you a little story. Hindsight was a great thing, but a little story here is, I remember handling in my notice at my uh, at my job, and I was like, yeah. "Hey, look, my name was Andrew. It says Andrew. Um, I've been here for two years. You love it. You know, I love it here. You love me working here. We've done a lot of things together. A lot of progressive growth. But I quit. However, I'm going freelance. <laughs> I wanted to know if you'd be happy being my first client. And he was like, "You know what? You're out of order. But yes." <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to lose you on the team, but I understand yeah. why you're doing it and what you're doing. And he, think, he thought, you know, uh, he thought I was bold, um, but he was like, yeah, I, yeah. Want, I want you on the team. So what's it going to cost? And, and that was my first proper client was actually my ex-boss. Um, and That's their team, incredible. Right? So, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that cool. that is really good. Because, so I'm assuming from that, then you didn't kind of do, I guess, maybe the typical thing when people do go freelance, where they're kind of building it up the client roster. And then they're like, Oh, I now have too much work to balance this out with my full time, I'm gonna go f completely freelance. Like, how did you, I guess, prepare to go freelance? I went all in, man. <laughs> just walked in. <laughs> I literally had that. You said I've had enough. Everyone said, <laughs> yeah. I, what, do you know what? I, what was really mad is I I loved my job. Like I really enjoyed mm. where I was working and what I was doing. So it wasn't, you know, a lot of people when they go freelance, it comes from a point of, you know, someone's been made redundant or someone's like, you know, had a family and then thought, you know what, I want to spend more time with the kids and my staff flex. So for me, that wasn't like a big yeah. pivot change. It was just, I was at, the, the limit in terms of where I was in terms of that career. And I thought the next mm. step for me, I have the flex and dictate to myself, be my own boss and be in a situation where I can control what I work and when and where. Um, right. And what was really interesting as well is like speaking and doing conferences, I always had to do under the name of my employer. Um, I couldn't mm. really get much credit for that. Because of course, the company I was working for was giving me the time cool. off to go and do these things. So, Absolutely. and of course, if I say, I'm talking about this great topic, whether it's GA4 or e-commerce or whatever it is, and then yeah. I say, I am Luke from Company X, no one's ever going to really reach out to me because I'm, I'm employed, right? So like, yeah. this guy's talking a really good game. He's got lots of cool things about him, but like, I can't hire him because he's got a job. So that really bugged me. Right. Um, and I was like, I want, I want all the smoke and all the goodness at the same time, right? I want to I want to take the hit, but <laughs> yes. also be in control of my own destiny. <laughs> So I just jumped to the deep end and went, right, where I'm working right now is peak. Like I'm doing really well. My boss is super happy. But also I picked a particular point where I, I knew it would make it difficult for my boss to say no. And that's cheeky of me right. to do that. But it the is. team was still worked out. <laughs> it worked out, right? So um yeah, it was it was just kind of a point where I thought, I love my job, but I want more. I want to be in more control. I did have a, a, my son was born at the time. My daughter was, I think, how old was my daughter? About four years ago. She would have been two. Um, and I just thought, I want to spend more time with my family. I want to just, yeah, mm. I wanted to be that me. Um, mm. And yeah, it, it was a great decision. It's, it's not always a great decision. I won't say to anyone, freelance is an easy ride, but um, <laughs> I wouldn't look back now and change anything. I think it's been awesome. Amazing. Yeah. And you've like, so you've, you've mentioned these speaking opportunities that you had. How did you get into that in the first place? I mean, I know like there's a few people at VG that are kind of building that up and are really keen to be do to do more speaking events. What, like, how did yeah. you get into it? Was it your previous employer that had put you up for it? Like, how did you kind of also know of the events and where you wanted to speak at as well? Yeah, do you know what's crazy? Um, my employer had nothing to do with it. I actually go and had to go and say to my employer, um, just to let you know, mate, I've got a, uh, a speaking gig <laughs> over in Seattle a few days. Do you mind if I go? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, I've got to speak at a conference in Seattle. I'm happy to like f fly the brand name and everything else when I'm out in the US. And he was like, sure. do what you've got to do. So he was really, he really allowed me to kind of build that, that kind of personal brand for myself. Mm. Um, and allowed me to do it. And I think some employers, it's not that straightforward. Your boss might be a little bit less, um, you know, forthcoming in terms of giving you the time and so on. But sure. I had a really good, um, but in terms of like finding the speaking slots, 
for me, it was just attending the events, uh, aggressively networking, saying hello, making yourself seen, recording videos. In fact, I'll tell you, tell you a secret. So it's not really a secret, but something I haven't really mentioned is, you know, a conference called um, Search Love? Yes. It's put on by In people Lee, to be still. Right. So Search Love is over. Search Love have a conference in London. They have one in San Diego, and I think there's one somewhere else. But it's a, it's a big kind of global. Ah, okay. Right. Uh, okay. It's different. Than what I was thinking. Right. right. Over a thousand pound ticket, like it, it's money, right? But there I was mean, an opportunity yeah. where they were, um, so they were opening uh, opportunities for people to speak who have never spoken before. So you just recorded a video mm. of yourself the whole thing you know get across your personality talk about your topic and i thought you know what i'm going to do i'm not going to do what everybody else is going to do i'm going to go stand on oxford street and i'm going to record a video of myself talking about marketing for 30 seconds right and i said in a video nice. if i can speak you know if i can speak on oxford street and do this then imagine what i can do on your stage and then the next thing you know uh that was really probably the springboard for my speaking career um right but you've just got to get out there and just really kind of get stuck in you know mm. yeah was it a, was it then like a kind of like a goal that you'd given yourself in terms of speaking like was it something that you knew you already enjoyed was it some another way to challenge yourself yeah so I've, I've always I've always kind of enjoyed um public speaking even before like SEO even way back in probably like school and stuff I've always been the one right who'd be happy to go and present and work at the front of the class and stuff so mm. um yeah I think I attended an SEO conference um gosh so many years back and thought you know what? I'd love to be in a situation where I had enough knowledge and was confident enough to be on the stage so it yeah. was a goal and I knew if I really wanted to kind of get to freelance at some point, getting an exposure, building a brand and being on the stage would really help me out. Um, mm. But yes, it's, uh, it's something that even now to this day, I, I enjoy doing and continue to seek out. Right, so. Amazing. I, I love that. And that is definitely very inspiring. And it is true that I think it is once you kind of get your name on one of those lineups and you've got that reference that you can say well I spoke on yes. this stage and then it kind of really gets the ball rolling I guess in a sense yeah um, exactly I mean your I mean your name now I think is pretty well known within the industry whether it be through events or just you know from the amazing things that you do do you do things like mentoring or anything like that or have you ever sought out a mentor um I have done mentoring before I actually did mentoring um ironically right this is really interesting I've never really thought about it <laughs> uh with eBay so where my kind of career started right. I did some mentoring yeah with eBay full circle a, exactly full circle um with eBay and a social enterprise and it was to help um either existing businesses that were kind of small intimate you know sole traders uh duos um local kind of high street brands all the way kind of through to students who were thinking about getting into the space and just kind of like look this is the mistake that i made these are the things you need to avoid um spend some money here don't spend money there don't buy into this hype and just kind of walk people through mm. the 101 of e-commerce and marketing and online business growth um i've done some stuff with a couple of universities here in birmingham um spoken at a few of them mentored a couple of students in their final year and i've really enjoyed it um and i'm just properly candid with everyone i come across like look let's just cut the bs right i'm not your tutor um ask me any questions you want if you you know disagree with something that i'm saying please tell me tell me why so i can take the feedback on board um equally yeah. if you're in a situation where you've spent a lot of money and you're struggling tell me because i've been there don't try and pretend that you're doing really well if you're not be honest with me and i can help you as best as i can but um yeah all of that sort of stuff and kind of giving back and and um yeah i i i love to do it when i can for sure nice that's really good and actually like i mean for people out there if you've heard of us as BG, you'll know that one of our kind of slogans is all about kind of diversifying digital and like really kind of pushing that agenda of kind of diversity and inclusion within the industry. And I think it is a topic now that is being spoken about 
a lot more people are getting platformed and you know we're not all being kind of shoved into like a little room as if it's like a, a side topic it has that been something that you've been aware of that's been of importance to you as well yeah it, you know what it's one of those things that um i kind of battle in my head sometimes and it, it's something that me and my partner have discussed um because we both work in the same field so right. where you know sometimes you, you have to think about whether you've been chosen because you're black and to fill a void or you've mm. been chosen because you're good at what you do right yes. um and arguably for some kind of events it could be both which is fine um and you know it's kind of like you have to just put your own um demons if you like in the closet and just think that you know what i've been chosen because i'm great and even if yeah. i have been chosen because i tick a box let me show them that i'm way beyond just a tick box exercise mm. um so that's like one thing and then i think the second thing is everybody loves a role model right it doesn't matter what yeah. color they are what size they are what you believe in like everybody loves a role model um and I, I, I don't think I'm in a situation where I can say to someone that I'm a role model for a lot of people. But if someone who is like 16, 17, university student and sees someone that looks like them on the stage, then I think, or even just watching this, right? I think yeah. it's super helpful and inspiring to know that you're in a situation where you can be just like them or inspired by them. And it gives you that boost of confidence. But it's, I mean, it'd be wrong of me to sit here and say that I don't see inequality in speaking events and so on but like you can't fix everything yeah. all at once so you've just For got sure. to be in a situation where you when you're given an opportunity you go away you smash it you are the person who you are and if there's something that comes around charitable events so one thing i've done as part of afro drops which is my e-commerce brand um for example is i have a lot of surplus stock um that either right. is approaching the end of its shelf life I don't really want to sell anymore. So rather than just selling it for a discount, I've actually given it this Christmas and New Year to a lot of families um, who are kind of struggling through Christmas with the whole cost mm. of energy crisis. Um, yeah. And just families who, you know, you know, there's some really kind of, I forget the numbers, but I've got some incredible stats on black children um, in the UK are X number of times more likely to deal with extreme poverty than any other race in the UK. So, like, if you right. think about, like, say, the cost of hair products, turning up to school, yeah. looking presentable, or weight and pressure around Afro hair and everything else and conforming, like, I just gifted about, I think it was about £1,200 worth of product in the end, just to communities that need the help and support to help them out. Amazing. And I think if you're in a position where you can give something back, um, you know, do it. And that that's kind of the situation Absolutely. I see myself yeah 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 no definitely i think yeah it is obviously yeah whatever whatever people can do then a lot of time it's, it's probably worth doing uh for sure yeah. um okay so we're gonna wrap up with a little game um so i like yeah i like to conclude episodes with you know a quick game maybe get into the minds or something that's a bit lighter um, I've done this game a few times actually, and I always think it's quite interesting what comes out. It's word association. Okay. So in the simple of idea, I give you a word and you tell me what first comes to mind. Um, okay. <laughs> I, in theory, it shouldn't really trip you up, but you know, who knows? We'll, we'll see what comes out of it. <laughs> we'll, see. Um, we'll, we'll start light and easy um, with SEO. Technical. Technical. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I was going to say straight away, our CEO probably would be thrilled <laughs> that you went for technical. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, next one, events. Networking. Nice. Um, E-commerce. Marketplaces. CRO. Revenue growth. It's two words. Ooh. That that's all right. I'll, I'll get. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Um, entrepreneur. Thought leadership. Oh, interesting. Um, digital. Automation. Don't know why I went there. 
<laughs> I mean, I guess that is the word of the moment, isn't it? Um, it is. Yeah. And then, okay, my last one is success. Individual. Oh, I really like that. Can I I'm going to explain the last one. Yes, please. Yeah. So the reason why I say this is because success looks so different to different people. So like success for someone mm. could be financial, reaching a financial goal, while success yeah. for somebody else could just be a level of health or um, kind of being in a situation where you're free of whatever it is that's causing you pain, right? Like it doesn't have to be monetary mm. and everyone's idea yeah. of success shouldn't be mirrored or compared against somebody else's. Like if you're happy in a two bed house and as long as you can get the heating on and you can get to work and you've got food in your belly every night that for many people is just mm. success which i think yeah. is actually a great ceiling for success for other people it's to drive a lambo and to kind of you know have a nice yacht and a massive house um and for those people so be it but you shouldn't necessarily look at one person's idea of success and then automatically yeah. want that because somebody else is and we're, we're as a society i think are so driven by everybody else's idea of what success is or well, for me it's telling my family mm. it's work hard without being overly stressed um and it's to get to a level of security that helps me and makes me feel mm. secure that, like i don't want to be a millionaire right there's just too much pressure in all of that i just can't bother yeah that. but like financial security and knowing that i can go on holiday a couple times a year we can eat good we can go out you can buy nice things every now and again, but I've still got to save. Like that for me is kind of like where I want to be at. You know? Nice, yeah. No, I, I honestly, I, I couldn't agree more. And it is that is why I do quite like asking, like doing this game and asking because people always yeah. have, well, they always associate a different word with it. But I think it's within that kind of vicinity of, of you know, not all success looks the same essentially and i think yeah. that is something really important to hold on to especially when we are in a day and age where it's so easy to compare and it's like every platform out there is built for us to measure and to compare successes so it is it is good to have a, a handle on it and to understand what success means to you as an individual for sure yeah yeah absolutely um, well, thank you so much, Luke. It's flown by. It's been a really good time. I hope for you as much as it has been for me. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and making the time. Before we close, is there anything you would like to plug? Um, gosh. Is there anything <laughs> I'd like to plug? Putting you on the spot. <laughs> You know what, actually, anyone who is thinking about getting into the world of SEO or digital marketing, um, I would advise people take a good look at Traffic Think Tank. Um, I think it's an incredible resource of resources, mistakes, learnings, quick wins, facts um, from really, really powerful, incredible and intelligent people in this space. Um, so analytics, SEO, content, links, whatever it is, Traffic Think Tank, yeah. I think, is a great resource. I'm not affiliated uh, with them. I've done some work with them, but I just think they've got a great Slack community, um, brilliant bunch of people, very supportive, and so much knowledge. Um, so, yeah, go and check it out, Traffic Think Tank. Wow, incredible plug. I'm so glad that I asked that question. I'm going to go check them out as well. It sounds really good. Awesome. Um, great. Well, thank you to everyone for listening. Make sure that you're subscribed to all of our channels so that you don't miss any of the episodes. So that's at Viaduct.gen on Instagram, Viaduct Generation on both LinkedIn and YouTube, and at Viaduct underscore Gen on Twitter. Um, thank you very much once again, Luke. Um, and I'm sure we will bump into each other soon at some kind of an event. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope so. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I'll speak to you soon.